Hi, I'm Fernando Pereira from UFMG in Brazil, and today we shall talk about the importance of cycle detection when solving large constraint systems with conditional constraints. In particular, we will discuss the importance of collapsing cycles when solving Anderson's style points to analysis. The algorithm that we have seen to solve the systems with conditional constraints amounts to finding the transitive closure of a graph over and over. And there is also the propagation of information that I called the march of the landings, if you remember. This algorithm is computationally expensive. It takes cubic time on the number of vertices to solve. But since the early 2000s, people have realized that this algorithm can be greatly improved in terms of speed if we find and collapse cycles. Before we move on, think about it. Why can we collapse cycles in this kind of gra graph-based algorithm? By collapsing a cycle, I mean to transform a cycle into a single node. In other words, we are adding edges to the constraint graph. It's possible that we create cycles upon inserting new edges in this graph. We can replace the entire cycle for a single node. This is safe because, due to the flow of information, all the nodes in a cycle will be bound to the same information. Now comes the important question. How to find cycles? In principle, we could find cycles simply running a depth-first search in the graph. One of the main services of a DFS is to find cycles anyways. But this is not very efficient. Remember, we are talking about graphs that might have thousands of nodes for large programs. Running DFS in these graphs all the time is not good. So when should we run our DFS to find cycles? Would you like to think about it? You can stop the video and think about the, this question. When to run the DFS to find a cycle? Well, solutions are mostly heuristics. One of the best known is called late cycle detection after an algorithm that was published in PLDI in 2007. This heuristic is very smart. Basically, if we add an edge between two nodes that already have the same points to set, then that's a strong indication that we might have created a cycle. Then we run the DFS to check it, if that's true, starting from the destination node of the new edge. To implement late cycle detection, basically we add a small section to our old Anderson style algorithm. It's this part in red. Upon adding a new edge from n to z, if these nodes have the same values in their points to set, we try to find and collapse a cycle in this graph, starting from z. We also add the edge n z to a cache r of edges, so that we do not try to find cycles due to this edge again. In in case it's still in the graph. That prevents the algorithm from trying to find the same cycle over and over. Let me use this program here to demonstrate how lazy cycle detection works. We start building the points to graph. The graph has five vertices, one for each variable in the program, and two solid edges, one for each simple constraint, namely a equals b and b equals c. We propagate the points to facts from c to b and then to a before we start iterating the algorithm. We have one complex constraint, which is the load c equals pointer e. To solve this constraint, we notice that e contains a, therefore c equals pointer e e creates an edge from A to C. Once we add this edge to the graph, we form a cycle. Including this new edge, we also trigger cycle detection because the points to set of A and C is the same. Cycle detection will naturally find a cycle. 
and then it groups the three vertices, that is A, B, and C, into a single node that I'm calling A bar B bar C. The point to set of this node contains a single value, which is D. This means that the points to set of A, B, and C contains equally this value D. At this point, our algorithm terminates, for iterating the complex constraint once again does not change the graph, so the whole process stabilizes. Lazy cycle detection is a heuristic. It works pretty well, and it even is used in some mainstream implementations of points to analysis. It's simple to implement, and it leads to a pretty fast algorithm when we compare to other implementations. However, it also has drawbacks. One of these drawbacks is the fact that many cycles might still remain in the constraint graph while the algorithm runs, and also many searches might fail. To contrast lay cycle detection with other algorithms, I will show you another way to deal with cycles. This other way that we will see is called wave propagation. The idea of this algorithm is to separate the process of solving constraints into different phases. First, we find and collapse cycles in the constraint graph, and then we propagate information. And only after that, we create edges. We keep iterating this process until the graph stops changing. Something important is that there is a fast algorithm to find cycles in graphs. It was published in 1994 in this paper on finding strongly connected components in a direct graph. And wave propagation relies heavily on this algorithm. This is the algorithm that implements wave propagation. It's also quite simple, at least when we look at it from some distance. We iterate this three phases approach of collapsing cycles here, propagating information, the phase that we, call, that we call wave propagation, and then adding new edges until the graph stops changing. So we have this boolean here that marks when the graph stops changing. Let's look into each one of these phases and separate. This is the algorithm that propagates information. Information is propagated in a topological ordering of the graph. Thus, each node is guaranteed to be visited only once. And the algorithm uses a cache to avoid having to propagate data that has already been dealt with before. You can stop the video and read the algorithm at this point if you want to understand it. And this is the algorithm that creates new edges. The algorithm uses caches, again, to avoid recreating edges. Basically, edges are created in batches, after the propagation of information, but only new points that arrive at nodes should contribute to the creation of new edges. So the algorithm basically uses a cache to separate these new points. Whatever is in a node minus what is in its cache is considered a new point. Once we find new points, the creation of edges is like in the basic algorithm that we had seen before. We shall illustrate how wave propagation works using this example. Would you like to try to draw the initial constraint graph? You can stop the video and pick up a piece of paper plus a pencil to draw the chart. You have to draw the vertices, the edges, and the points to facts in, the, in each node. Then you obtain the initial constraint graph. So I hope you have drawn something like this graph. We need to start finding collapsing cycles. And incidentally, we do have a cycle right here. So after collapsing nodes B and C, we have this new chart, new graph. Now we must propagate points to facts. That's the march of the lemmings, if you recall how I was calling it. But only that this time lemmings march in a topological ordering of the graph. So there is only one node with information that must be forwarded to the other nodes, and this is vertex A. We copy value E into the point to set of node H and the composed node PC. Now we need to inter iterate the complex constraint. 
we have two complex constraints. To solve the first, that is d equals star h, right here, we look into the points to set of h. It contains three values. These are c, e, and g. We then add edges from c to d, from e to d, and from g to d. After that, we look into star e equals f, the second complex constraint. Note e contains only one value in its point to set. That's g. We then create an edge from f to g, and the figure shows the graph that we obtain after adding all these edges. Because the graph has changed, we start all over again, first finding collapsing cycles. That forces us to join d, f, and g into a single node here. We try to propagate information, but nothing really changes this time, and then we are done. That's the final graph that we obtain. There are a few questions that remain. First, what's the complexity of this algorithm? I mean, wave propagation and even laser cycle detection. What's their asymptotic complexity? You might want to think about it stopping the view. But the thing is that these heuristics do not really reduce the complexity of the basic algorithm. They are still cubic. A second question is, what is the meaning of this graph here that we obtain after running the points to analysis? Maybe that's the most important question because it gives us the semantics of points to analysis. Well, this graph is a representation of the heap. It shows us a conservative estimate of all the possible ways in which pointers can point to memory. That's a conservative estimate in the sense that we are solving a May analysis. If you remember, we have May must analysis. In May, they, they say things that may happen during the execution of the program, but that will not necessarily happen. That means that some of these arrows in the heap here, they may never really occur in an execution of the program. What's important is that if a pointer P can point to a variable V, then V must be in the point to set of P. So with wave propagation, we close this class on points to analysis. This course web, uh, the course web page still contains some material about a different kind of points to analysis that's called Stingsguard's algorithm. We will not really cover it in the videos, at least not this semester, but you are welcome to take a look into the course web page to know more about it. The, the other algorithms that we had seen are all from papers published in programming languages conferences, which I have listed here, and from Anderson's dissertation. So good reading and thank you.